This is KATU Channel 2 News for Sunday, May 18th. Reported by Bill Boaz with sports, Fred Jenkins with weather, Robin Anderson, and Stan Wilson. Good evening once again, everyone. Eight people are now known dead this evening following the massive eruption of Mount St. Helens early today. That eruption has radically changed the look of the peak, destroying a large portion of it. Geologists say this is by far the strongest eruption in the latest series, and it continues tonight. Channel 2's Essex Porter has the story. Geologists recorded the time as 8.32 this morning. Gas pressure building inside the mountain finally reached the bursting point. They think first there was an earthquake, registering five on the Richter scale. Then a split second later, the mountain started tearing itself apart. Four service planes have been flying as close as they dare to the mountain all day. But no one has seen portions of the north and northeast face. Tonight, officials say it's simply disintegrated. The area of what we had called the bulge for the last several weeks is the area that now is the opposite. It's a bowl-shaped depression. It's essentially an extension of the crater. The summit crater is much enlarged. The, the top of the mountain is not there because the crater now incorporates the area that was formerly part of the top of the mountain. And this crater now opens onto the north side, essentially it's breached to a very low level on the north side uh, to make a sort of open bowl-shaped depression, which is open to the bottom. And many pyroclastic flows have gone down into that bowl and swept out across the north side of Mount St. Helens and at least two and probably across Spirit Lake. The last flight that was up uh, had a chance to take a look at the north and uh, west side out away from the mountain. And I'm going to turn around here and point to the map a little bit. But this area right up here, out in this direction, for about 15 miles, all of the timber was probably blowing down in that area in a long, narrow swath. They were able to notice that. They said they had practically no vegetation at all on the north side up to the Mount Margaret area, and that's uh, what they're talking about. They said there wasn't even as much as a stump there, that all of the, the trees were over on their sides. At the high point on the mountain now is at, in the southwest corner is at about 8,400 feet in elevation. Along with the explosion, a pyroclastic blast swept down the northeast flank. Composed of poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas heated to 800 degrees, the shock wave leveled an area 15 miles long and several miles wide. These pictures were shot on the south side of the mountain. Thick black ash and fumes made travel to the north too dangerous. At one time, the plume of ash rose to 50,000 feet before being carried off to the east by the wind. On the ground, forest fires were set off by the hot gases. The ash is slowing their spread, and a Forest Service firefighting team will survey the situation tomorrow. No lava has been seen yet, but blocks of pumice several feet in diameter have been thrown from the crater. Everything is happening so fast that officials say they simply don't have answers for many of the questions, but they do know the major eruption they expected has come. And that eruption continues tonight, 15 hours after it began. Essex Porter reporting, Channel 2 News. Now, just before airtime, geologists confirm there is now a second volcanic vent on the mountain. It's located four miles west of Spirit Lake by the Toodle River. Already four devastating walls of water have roared down through the Toodle River Valley, the fourth coming late this afternoon, perhaps the most damaging of all. The Toodle River swelled to three and four times its normal size. If you look closely, you can see the wall of water more than 10 feet high. Whole trees were uprooted, floating like toothpicks down the raging river. At one point, hundreds of logs encircled a house already severely damaged by the mud and water. In other places, some houses were completely destroyed as the river washed out everything in its path. The people who hadn't been evacuated tried to escape today on foot. We don't know for sure how many of those people didn't make it. The Air Force 304th Rescue Squadron evacuated as many people as possible using the Toodle High School as a landing base. If there were doubts about the deadly power of the river, there are no more. A freight train met the same fate as everything else in the path of the river. The buses were brought in to help in the evacuation. This destruction you're seeing is from the fourth wave to sweep the valley. Right now, no one knows if there will be new waves or how deadly they would be. Robin? Stan, it's so dangerous tonight, so confusing on Mount St. Helens that even experts aren't clear what has happened. But what is clear is that miles of forest land has been flattened. Forest land many people were calling home. And for the few people air rescuers have brought out, it's a frightening tale of survival in a nightmare. Bill Van Amber reports.
It started in Tootle, but when threats from the rising river got too bad, the massive air rescue efforts moved to Kelso. All day and into the evening, searching through almost impossible situations to find almost impossible survivors. People who had made it through dust, ash, and devastated forests, struggling to survive in a wilderness gone hellishly mad. These two young campers and their dog had been staying along the Green River, more than 15 miles from the mountain, when suddenly the forest was flattened. Yeah, it was really bad. What was it like? I mean, how long were you in there? Well, too long. Too long. Yeah. But, uh, it took two of our best friends' lives, so it was really bad. There had been six in their party. Two others were injured but got out. These people had had to hike well over 14 miles, as did this man, whose family was worried he was dead. They brought out, uh, I think there were two boys and uh, a couple of... driven his truck until it just plain quit. He couldn't shake any more ash out of the air cleaner, walking in a dusty gray rain until choppered out. Fortunately, his family is safe as well. Unfortunately, it's a hit and miss situation for rescuers. You had to have an aircraft with you to get ours in and out because of the dust conditions when you're going in. You go inadvertent IFR down to a road and you just have to make an approach right to the ground. And uh, you're covered with dust by the time you get down. Uh, it's devastating. It looks like a, a hydrogen bomb or some atomic type of explosion. Everything is just level. There's nothing uh, upright. All the trees are down. Um, it's just solid white ash everywhere. You know? At daybreak, the choppers hit the air again, hoping to find more survivors, but as the people who have made it out tell what it was like, it's clear that staying hopeful is the only way to cope with what is almost a hopeless situation. And it's unfortunate that the toll in lives seems almost certain to rise. From Kelso Airport, I'm Bill Van Amberg for Channel 2 News. If the eruption of Mount St. Helens is awesome, its effects are devastating. The volcano has triggered wave upon wave of flash floods on the Tudor River, eventually taking eight lives. We have two reports, the first from Paul Majors on the latest flooding. Shortly after 5 p.m., the third wall of water came crashing down the Tudor River, carrying logs, chunks of ice from the Shoestring Glacier on Mount St. Helens and other debris. In some areas, the Tudor has been reported at 20 feet above its banks, wiping out anything in its path. The trees that have withstood other natural disasters buckled and snapped in the wake of the water that carved new channels wherever it pleased. Then early this evening, the fourth flash flood came roaring down the river, its speed estimated at 40 miles per hour. One home in the area was in the path of the roaring waters, and like everything else, it was no match for the surging river. Carried downstream like a small dollhouse, it too became another victim of the tootle. A tootle shed floating down the river had better luck, managing to stay in one piece. Four miles east of the town of Tootle, Camp Baker, a warehouser logging operation once on the banks of the Tootle, now a part of the river. Equipment overturned, buildings destroyed, five people lost their lives here when the river came charging through. Early this morning, the first wave came crashing down the once quiet Tootle. Tim Storrs and photographer Jeff Olson were there. Here's a report. Down the Tootle River, the waters of the first flash flood roared, just on the heels of the initial explosion of the mountain at 8.40 this morning. The Weather Service had issued a flood warning, and it came none too soon. As a 20-foot wall of brown water barreled down the canyon, it smashed into the warehouser company's Camp Baker. It was this initial wave pushing tons of mud into the camp that buried it. It covered the road through the camp, covered the rail line, smashing the railroad bridge downriver from the camp and washing it away. As the lumber and slash from the camp washed away, it piled up against bridge columns and crooks in the river, further downstream damaging the main north-south rail line across the river. It was the initial floods that killed. But it was not just the water that destroyed. An Air Force Reserve Captain from Portland's 304th Air Rescue Squadron, Robert Weed, says at least two of the dead found here were killed by heat, fried as he describes it. The two apparently trapped by a pyroclastic flow, a high temperature river of ash and gas. Continuing, Reed says, trees and all the vegetation was laid out flat, singed, burned, steaming, and sizzling. He reports animals standing around in apparent shock, covered with ash. It is estimated by aerial observers that the initial flash floods on this river expanded it to two to three times its normal width. 
and there is no sign that as the eruption continues, the floods will cease. Tim Storch reporting for Channel 2 News. Just about everyone has been cleared out of the Toodle River Valley now, many taken to evacuation sites in Longview, Kelso, and Ridgefield. Cameraman Don Stapleton and I were at the Red Cross Center at a school in Longview this evening. We found a lot of confusion about who got out and who stayed behind. The Red Cross was ready. Within hours, Cascade Middle School was converted into an emergency relief center for those who had nowhere else to go. Sleeping cots were set up, along with food and medical supplies. Two nurses are standing by around the clock for emergency medical help. School will open as usual here tomorrow at Cascade Middle School, but the students will have to share their school with the people evacuated from the Toodle River area. The Red Cross says it can handle as many as a thousand people here, 24 hours a day, for as long as necessary. That could be weeks. Among the first to arrive, Fred Winningham, Randy Peck, and their families. The disaster is already producing its first heroes. Randy and Fred helped save two people from the devastation. Mud, the mud was up to my neck, just below my chest here. At one point, I was on my hands and knees. It took us 45 minutes to go 300 yards. We finally got down to where the people were, and what happened is they were camping in the park, and uh, he said he pulled back his tent canvas, and the mud hit him right then, washed the car down the river, washed the tent down the river. He said he looked for his girlfriend. He, her head was the only thing visible. It was down between two logs. He pulled her out. She had a fractured leg and a fractured arm. We got there. We helped him get her up on the bank. We covered her up. She was visibly in shock. He was really just scarred up all over the place also, but he was, the adrenaline was going. And Mrs. Judy Varner brought her family along, but left her husband behind. We have animals and stuff, and he won't leave them. <laughs> and we have cows to take care and stuff like that. And so he said he wouldn't come, and the last I heard, he might come out at 7 if they go, will go back after him. And there's uh, three other guys, the last I heard, that's still up there. Are you, are you afraid for him right now? Yes, <laughs> I am. No one knows how long these people will be forced to remain in the evacuation center. In Yakima, Washington, and other cities east of Mount St. Helens, volcanic ash several inches thick is piling up like black snow. The fallout is so thick, Yakima has been shrouded in darkness all day. We have this report from Ken Crockett. The National Weather Bureau office in Yakima has been closely monitoring the situation since the eruption occurred early this morning. Tons of ash have been spewing into the atmosphere, and the Yakima Valley has been one of the hardest hit in the state. Meteorologist Bud Graves says the volcano is having a strong impact on our weather. Probably the most significant thing is that as the air has uh, gone, or as the mountain has erupted, it's just upset the atmosphere. That uh, mass of material and everything has just been shot straight up into the atmosphere, and it's kind of just rippling off, and it, uh, the atmosphere is going up and down, or the air is being lifted up and down, and this sets off a thunder shower or a thunderstorm. Uh, I don't know if there's rain with it. It's, it's awfully hard to tell because we've got so much ash. Those winds that keep blowing the ash into the area are expected to continue in the same direction. And Graves says there's little let up expected. All of the uh, upper winds are coming right from a west to southwesterly direction and that's just right upstream. We're right upstream from it. We are apparently on the south center part of the plume. Uh, the Dalles does not have any. Their visibility was 30 miles. Uh, it has spread to Wenatchee now. They're down as bad as we are. Moses Lake and Ephrata are as bad as we are. Tri-Cities has not had it quite as bad. They were down to two miles at uh, two o'clock this afternoon. There's no approaching for, uh, storm fronts or anything that might uh, kind of blow the wind around? Not uh, for the rest of today, no. I'm afraid we're stuck with it here for uh, at least the next uh, 12, 24, possibly 48 hours. At this time, unless there's a sudden decrease in volcanic activities or an unexpected change in the winds, we can expect to have the ash falling from time to time for the foreseeable future. Our reporter, Paul Majors, talked to his father-in-law, Robin, over in Yakima just a little bit of a while ago, and they're having some problems, obviously, with the water supplies there. Apparently, they're being asked now to fill up their bathtubs with the clean drinking water, so if the water supply does become contaminated tomorrow, they'll at least have some clean water on hand there. But obviously, an incredible sight there at noon. The, s the sun blotted out from the sky. Unbelievable. Black as midnight. Unbelievable. We also understand that that ash continues to move in a southeasterly pattern. We have had reports of definitely sightings and problems in Lewiston, Idaho. It's going to move uh, down into Wyoming as well. We don't know where it's going to stop. One of the big concerns, of course, are the reservoirs and the dams south of the mountain. Uh, coming up next in the news, we'll take a look at the details on that, and we'll also have a report on some of the victims from today's disaster. Stay with us.
Reservoirs on the south side of Mount St. Helens took in more than 13,000 acre feet of muddy water today. Spokesman for Pacific Power and Light Company said the level of water has stabilized now and the reservoirs have the capacity to handle another 100,000 acre feet. Earlier today, PPNL workers flew to the dam at Swift Reservoir in an Air National Guard chopper to open those spill gates. This evening, the spill gates downstream at Lake Merwin were lowered another two feet to accommodate the water. PPNL spokesmen say they have avoided a repetition of the Tudor River flooding on the Lewis River. Mudslides caused by the eruption also caused flooding in southwest Washington. We have a series of reports beginning with this story from Channel 2's Paul Hansen. Flash flood warnings were out on the Toodle River and Washington State Police immediately blocked off Interstate 5 north and south of the river, afraid the wall of water descending through the Toodle River Valley would damage or destroy the Interstate 5 bridge over the river. The Toodle flooding began when mudslides occurred at Mount St. Helens. Cameraman Alan Anderson and sound technician Mike Rospero and I were prevented from driving to the bridge, so we walked. An eerie silence surrounded us as we walked down the empty interstate thoroughfare, the silence broken only by the sound of helicopters and light aircraft circling overhead in the distance. The Ed Souders family lives just south of the Tudor along I-5. Are you going to uh, leave your home? I'm no. I'm, they haven't told us. I'm going they to go They haven't told us nothing, but I told, called the state patrol and they said he could go south on interstate and go to work. Uh -huh. He has to go to work. Why should we leave home? I mean, it's stuff there. It's not... <laughs> The river, we know we've had floods Stewart's here right before. Over there. About a half a mile. Well, left this two the rivers got high and it never bothered us here. I see. You don't seem nervous. <laughs> no, I'm not. We're, we're, we're 69 feet above sea levels. So I wouldn't worry about it. But the scene at the Toodle River was awesome, a reminder of the devastating power and fury of Mother Nature. The brown and black mud and a log jam a mile and a half long raced through the river valley. Luckily, the interstate bridge, though bumped and banged by the logs, was not damaged. Eyewitness David Klein. We just were sitting on the hill there and just watching. The water started getting a little darker and then pretty soon, you know, the logs started coming in. I don't know, after what, about five minutes, I guess, the logs were just... Gradually, the Tudor River became a giant mud hole filled with wood and other debris. A thick, soupy, textured flow of water continued, and by early afternoon, police reopened I-5 to north and southbound traffic. Sightseers and news reporters crowded the banks of the Tudor, awaiting a second flash flood. And not surprisingly, three youngsters ventured out onto the riverbank looking for dead fish. Perhaps they didn't know that flash floods give little warning. They eventually moved to higher ground, having beaten the odds. Police had blocked off Highway 5. 504 leading to Spirit Lake. One man who said he was north of Camp Baker at the time of the eruption pulled into a gas station at Castle Rock and it was apparent as we talked to him that he had lived through a nightmare. It's an uh, unfit place for man or beast, I'll tell you. It's a good way to get killed. It's terrible. Did it get dark? Pitch dark for at least two and a half hours. You can see absolutely nothing. The evidence of the intensity of the eruption of Mount St. Helens was the man's truck covered with an inch and a half of volcanic ash. At the Toodle River in southwest Washington, this is Paul Hansen, Channel 2 News. Three of the men caught on Mount St. Helens this morning are now at a manual hospital, severely burned by hot gases and ash. 30-year-old Leonti Skoragosov of Mount Angel and 36-year-old James Skymamki of Woodburn were trapped in their cars for seven hours before walking eight miles for help. Second and third degree burns cover their backs, legs, and arms. The third man, a Richard Carsa Lewis, is also badly burned, but his story is so far unknown. All three are apparently loggers. They are in stable but serious condition under round-the-clock treatment at the Oregon Burn Center. Stan, the eruption of Mount St. Helens is going to affect weather patterns throughout the western United States. Fred and the weather are next. I guess because of those winds, Fred, we're being spared all of that ash from uh, Mount St. Helens. What direction is it, is it going now? Is there any chance of it ever coming towards Portland? Uh, not at this point, uh, Stan. It appears that the westerly wind flow that uh, saved the Portland metropolitan area and, every, and all points west of Mount St. Helens will continue. That uh, interview with Bud Graves uh, over in Yakima today indicated that he also implied that the westerly wind flow will continue. The uh, conditions are... Well, they're bad on the east side, and they're fairly good in comparison here on the uh, on the uh, west side. Conditions as far as the uh, weather is concerned, uh, well, they will be.
kind of uh, decreasing in, in, in likelihood of any real uh, heavy activity here on the west side. Let's take a look at an upper wind chart. These, uh, this chart was drawn for about 18,000 feet, and it shows that westerly wind flow marching clear across the northern Pacific into the Pacific Northwest. There's kind of a fanning out area over the western sections of Montana, the eastern portions of Idaho at the present time. There are uh, reports out of uh, western Montana now at, uh, what was it, Bill? Missoula. So Missoula is closing down their schools tomorrow. Some of the businesses will be closed. The ash and plume is now into the western sections of Montana, moving down toward northeastern uh, Wyoming at the present time, and will continue that same general direction. This wind flow is not going to change in the next 24 to 36 hours. A lot of low pressure up in the Gulf of Alaska, and the wind coming down around the uh, bottom portion of that low and coming from the west toward the northeast, that same general track will uh, continue for the next couple of days. In fact, it may even increase somewhat. That is, the winds may uh, even buckle down a little bit further toward the south, and a generally southwest to northeast wind flow will probably be the uh, general direction of travel in the next day or so. The satellite picture I want to show you first was taken earlier this afternoon about 12.15, and the dark area over the central portions of uh, from Mount uh, St. Helens moving into the eastern sections of uh, uh, Washington, western portions of Montana, pretty well outline the heaviest concentration of ash and the, the get and the uh, plume associated with the fallout area moving into the western sections of Montana. Now that's changed a little bit due to those winds that I showed you just a moment ago. Tonight's satellite picture shows that that area of uh, fallout or area of plume is still uh, covering the southeastern portion of Washington. They're still reporting ash fall in Yakima and up in Spokane at the present time, and I'm, uh, there's probably a very good likelihood that it's continuing to fall up around Ephrata and as far north as Wenatchee now, but that's beginning to shift toward the east a little bit. Now the darker area, which indicates the strongest concentration, is definitely into the western sections of Montana. The leading edge of the plume is moving into the northeastern sections of Wyoming, so you can probably look into your uh, crystal ball or the uh, other media sources tomorrow and there's a good likelihood they're going to be talking about at least ash fall in those areas moving into the western portions of uh, Wyoming. And there's also associated with this, of course, the possibility of thunderstorm development, too. The reason being is that uh, particulate matter in the atmosphere is the basic cause of precipitation uh, forming. Uh, the uh, water moisture in the air has a tendency to congregate or coalesce around these little particles. And with all the junk that the uh, mountain has thrown into the air, there's quite a bit of con what we call con condensation nuclear for the possibility of uh, showers and uh, the good possibility of thunder showers. Temperatures around our area today, for the most part, weren't too bad. We had a high today here in Portland of 77 because we were spared, uh, for the most part, the, uh, the plume and the fallout. However, take a look at the uh, temperature in Yakima. They reached only 64 degrees. In fact, for most of the afternoon, they were down into the upper 50s. That's 64 temperature being reached probably before uh, tw uh, noon, uh, 1 o'clock their time. Temperatures in the southeastern sections of Washington, 72 at uh, Walla Walla, where they too were spared for the most part, 75 in uh, Pendleton, 80 degrees in the Dallas, down the valley, 74 degrees in Salem, 76 degrees in Eugene. Temperatures along the coast in the 50s and middle 60s, uh, due to the fact we have an onshore flow, we can get back to weather for just a moment, we're going to have an onshore flow. We're going to see some clouds, at least lower clouds, returning to the western sections of both Washington and Oregon tomorrow. And then as that next system moves into our area, we'll see an increase in upper level cloudiness and a uh, possibility of showers now still held off until probably uh, Wednesday. But as far as cloud cover is concerned, there'll be considerable amounts of clouds over the western portions of both Washington and Oregon tomorrow into Wednesday. Let's take a look at the forecast. Along the coast, they call or rather the current temperature. All right, we'll take a look at the forecast. Mostly cloudy, some afternoon clearing, and then again cloudy on uh, Wednesday. High temperatures 55 to 60, overnight lows 45 to 50. The valley will be mostly cloudy through Tuesday. There may be some afternoon sunshine. The temperatures will be held down into the 65 to 70 degree range. Overnight lows 45 to 50. The Cascades, variable higher clouds. The freezing level remaining between 8 and 10,000 feet at least. Westerly winds 5 to 15. The gorge will be uh, mostly cloudy tomorrow and Tuesday, especially at the west end. The clouds moving toward the east as the day progresses. 70 to 80 will be the highs. Overnight lows 45 to 55. Northeast Oregon, or at least east of the mountains. Variable clouds and a chance, a chance, it's a slight chance at this point of light ash fall in the extreme northeastern portion of the state tomorrow. 75 to 80 will be the uh, overall temperature range, 40 to 45 for overnight lows. For Portland and Vancouver, we'll have an uh, increase in lower clouds uh, by tomorrow morning. Then we'll see some afternoon clearing, but the higher clouds associated with the front offshore begin moving into our area, well, probably tomorrow night 
and uh, into uh, Wednesday. Uh, again, the shower probabilities are low until Wednesday at this point. 70 degrees will be the high tomorrow. The overnight low, 51. South and westerly winds at about 5 to 15 miles per hour. So with that westerly wind flow continuing, the areas that have already received ash uh, still are most vulnerable. The ash is now moving into the western portions of Montana and the northeastern sections of Wyoming. And that doesn't mean that it's over with in central Washington by any means. Still coming down in some of those areas. Right. The, uh, the activity on the mountain has decreased somewhat. And, we, and I say that because of the altitude of the tops of the plumes, which are now down about 16,000 feet. From that 63, 65,000? 63,000 feet, about uh, 4, 35 o'clock this afternoon. We can give people some idea, I don't know if you can see the, the picture here, some idea of what we're talking about. We brought back uh, a bag, actually, of the ash, as you can see here, from Yakima, I believe it was earlier, where they said there was an inch and a half, two inches falling in some place, and it's causing some problems with the water supply. I don't know if there's any immediate health hazards, Fred. It, there's no smell and no particular... <coughs> problems with the ashes, well, as, I can t as I can tell. You can see the, the dusty nature of it, and you just felt it. It's a very abrasive material. Uh, you, you might think of it this way. If you get it on your car and wipe your hand across it, it's going to take the paint off. You can imagine what it would do if it uh, if you happen to be outside and got a good portion of that in your lungs. The, the geologist watching it and tell me I shouldn't be getting this all over my hands right now. I'll, I'll bet you it's one of those sorts of things. Well, I, uh, from what I heard earlier this afternoon, the acidic uh, nature of this is really quite low as far as being burned or being maimed from feeling. I, I can't even feel the dance on my hand right now, so that's no, that's no particular pottery, problem. pottery, but very abrasive, and it, uh, it's a good idea not to be breathing. And of course, people with uh, people with some respiratory problems, I guess, should be staying in the well, Anybody person. that has respiratory problems should definitely stay from, uh, from going outside, stay inside, and uh, anybody that doesn't have to go out should do the same thing, stay indoors. Hard to believe they've got a couple of inches of this stuff falling on the ground in places like Yakima, but probably not going to get it here in Portland. No, not, not with that upper wind flow remaining from the west moving toward the east. Very good. We have a, a few words of advice uh, regarding this, this ash here. As ash from Mount St. Helens continues to fall this evening, law enforcement agencies in eastern Washington, Montana, northern Idaho, and western Montana have one word of advice. Don't. Don't drive. Don't leave home. Don't leave animals outside. And above all, don't panic. If ash falls on you or any of your belongings, or if you get it on your hands, don't try to rub it off. I guess I'll have to rinse it off. They say the best advice is to rinse that off with large amounts of water. Unless it is an emergency, do not use the phone. The circuits are already overloaded. And once again, the best advice is don't panic. And as, you, as we mentioned, if you get it on your hands, Robin, wash it off. Don't rub it off. I've got it all over me right now, so I'm going to have to find some way of getting it off. <laughs> Very good, Stan. And of course, the eruption is causing a lot of commotion, um, uh, which extended for hundreds of miles um, all the way to Portland Heights as people strained to get a view of the exploding mountain. We have a story now from Channel 2's reporter Jim Hyde. He was around the city today and went watching all the people as they went to watch the mountain. Found to watch the volcanic spectacle. The road to Piddick Mansion was jammed with cars and people who couldn't find parking space near the top. Once they secured their vantage point, the mansion grounds became a forest of lenses, binoculars, and tripods. The mountain fading in and out of the clouds and mist, while the viewers tried to focus on the cascading plumes of smoke and ash. For the best equipped, the sights and sounds were electrifying. On the north face, we could see kind of where the uh bulge in the mountain was. I, apparently, I, I think it was where it was growing out in the past few weeks, and then uh, we saw it just literally erupt from that point, uh, and then about 10 seconds later, you could hear the kind of a rumbling, you know, afterwards. I think I've gotten some shots from it. You, you know. got some good ones? I hope so. Jeez, yeah, I hope so. Well, seen the mountain from an airplane. Lois Rasmussen had planned to take the train down from Seattle this morning, but the commotion at the station changed her plans. And everybody was lined up at the train station, and it, literally the announcer said, Mount St. Helens has blown her top, and that was the announcement. And uh, immediately everybody kind of went into panic, and they didn't know what, but I figured that if uh, that had happened, Interstate 5 was closed, and the only way to get back to Portland, which I needed to, was to take an airplane. In contrast to the deadly scenes along the Toodle River Valley, the spirit at Pittock Mansion was light. The sightseers, like geologists, and now the rest of the world, waiting to see what Mount St. Helens will do next. At Piddick Mansion, this is Jim Hyde reporting for Channel 2 News. Believe it or not, there is something else going on in the world besides the volcano today. Bill Boaz is here to tell me my favorite golfer, Tom Watson, ran into a little bit of trouble today. He was going for the biggest prize in golf, I guess you might say. He's going for, what, $254,000, took home a fair amount of change anyway. But He's not going broke. Will, no, he will never go broke, Stan. We'll have all the sports in there. 
But qualifying is over. The 33 car field is set for next Sunday's Indy 500. 14 cars ran fast enough to qualify today. 24 year old Tim Richmond leading the pack of rookie drivers. That's the largest first year contingent since 1965. Johnny Rutherford will sit on the pole next Sunday, while Spokane's Tom Sneva will start 33rd. The finalists in last year's Soccer Bowl met in a rematch at Tampa Stadium today. The host Rowdies and the Vancouver Whitecaps. Tampa Bay takes a 2 0 lead in the first 18 minutes on goals by Oscar Fabiani and Steve Weigerly. Early in the second half, the Whitecaps draw even Bob Belitho with the left foot. However, with 18 minutes remaining, Fabiani gets free behind the Vancouver defense. His second goal of the game gives the Rowdies a 3 2 win over Vancouver. Well, Tom Watson, the winner of more than $300,000 already this year, was in line for a $200,000 bonus today in Texas in the Colonial National Tournament, a tournament of great prestige. He did not win it. He finished fourth. Bruce Litsky came uh, from a tie with Tom Watt, or with uh, Ben Crenshaw on the 72nd green. He sank a 22-foot putt for the victory. For Bruce Litsky, that victory is worth $54,000. Coming up right here, that's the putt missed by Tom Watson. You can see his dismay. Moving along now, the 18th green. He's tied with Crenshaw. Bruce Litsky looks from 22 feet, drops in the center of the cup, $54,000 victory for Bruce Litsky. Meanwhile, the ladies went to sudden death. Donna Horton White beating Debbie Massey on the first extra hole in uh, Clifton, New Jersey. Pat Bradley, who started the day with a four-shot lead, ballooned to a 79. Checking baseball scores now on the evening. It was Chicago over Seattle, 6-5. Kansas City, 5-3 over California. Toronto beat Oakland, 12-1. Minnesota, 10-4 over Milwaukee. Texas wins in New York, 5-4 over the Yankees in 10 innings. Cleveland, 3. Boston, 1. Detroit 6-4 over Baltimore. In the National League, Los Angeles completes its sweep of Pittsburgh, 2-0 today. There's San Francisco 6-5 over St. Louis. San Diego 4-3 over the Cubs. Montreal and the Reds were rained out. Atlanta and the Mets split a pair, and it was Houston 3 and Philadelphia nothing. Tomorrow, the Portland Beavers take their only scheduled day off for the month of May, a chance to rest up for the Hawaii Islanders who invade Civic Stadium Tuesday. This afternoon, Pasquale Perez allowed just five hits in the Beavers' 4-1 victory over Tacoma. Portland trails the Tigers by one half game in the Northern Division. And a final look tonight, Rob, it looks like the Major League Baseball players will go on strike Thursday. Negotiations broke off a day after just three minutes of talks. That's it. Very good, Bill. And if I can't say I'm sorry to, to Tom Watson, Stan, I'm sorry. No, we're okay. all sorry. All right. <laughs> Geologists are missing uh, in the Mount St. Helens area, and of course the fate of Harry Truman remains unknown tonight. We'll have those stories when we return. This is a once-in-a-lifetime chance for geologists and other scientists who want to study the volcano and its effects. That work may have ended in tragedy for two observers who were at stations close to the mountain when it blew early today. David Johnson of the Geological Survey and Reed Blackburn, a private radio operator working for the survey, are missing and feared dead on the north side of the peak. Johnston was at the Coldwater, north, Coldwater 2 North Observation Post Sunday when Mount St. Helens erupted. He has not been seen or heard from since. The North Observation Post area is about five miles directly to the north of the summit at 4,100 feet, or about 1,400 feet above the North Tula River. The area appears to have been hit hard by the initial blast from the volcano. About four feet of ash and blocks of rocks are reported in the area, and all the trees have been blown over. Johnston went up to the observation post on Saturday morning and was last heard from by radio Sunday morning, this morning, before the eruption. Blackburn was at the Coldwater Number 1 observation post, about eight miles northwest of the summit. He is on assignment with the National Geographic magazine operating a radio that triggered time-lapse cameras at other places on the volcano. This was a scientific project being done in cooperation with the U.S. Geological Survey. Did you get right in it? The cold water number one area also was hit hard. His car was seen almost buried in ash and was on fire, but no sign of Blackburn has been seen. He had been at the observation post for two weeks. That search will continue tomorrow for both Johnston and Blackburn. Robin? Stan, the news just gets worse. It is probable tonight. Spirit Lake is no more. That's the word from the Forest Service. Survey crews say huge pyroclastic flows of hot ash, rock, and gas have enveloped the lake, turning it into a bubbling cauldron of hot debris. We have reports that Spirit Lake Lodge is totally wiped out. Those reports are unconfirmed. As for lodge operator, 84-year-old Harry Truman, we can only surmise he has realized his wish to go down with the ship. We understand the area is completely buried beneath 30 feet of mud. I last saw Harry about two weeks ago. It was one of many afternoons we'd spent together over the past year, and so I came to know Harry through his salty tales of days gone by, tales of running whiskey, and of the day he settled down. Harry, together with his wife, refused for nearly half a century to be defeated by the elements.
Germans. Their home was destroyed several times by high winds and fire. Each time they built it back again. But Harry's wife died five years ago, and it was because the two had spent their married life and the last days of her life together on the mountain that Harry refused to leave. It was for the love of his wife that Harry spit in the mountain's eye. <laughs> no, I'm not going to leave. You're damn right I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay here. If I left, it'd kill me if I left this place and lost my home, I'd die in a week. I, I couldn't live. I couldn't, I couldn't extend it. So I'm like that old captain, and I got him going down the ship. I said, if the damn thing takes this mountain, I'm going along with it. I'd rather be dead for than to live without it. Is that crazy? Damn stupid. Huh? Okay. The people see that, they say the craziest man in God's reading world, old Truman. St. Helens, absolutely north of the mountain. Now, if you look this over here, I'm north of Mount St. Helens, and I'm due east of Mount St. Helens. If you went down there to my, my dock and uh, put a compass across there, you'll find the north and south line going up and down, and the east and west. I'm completely east of Mount St. Helens, and my place is, and I'm completely north of it. There's no goddamn way at that mountain that hasn't got enough stuff to come my way. I've got a hill with trees there between me and that. No way in the world to do it. Those great scare the hell out of me. And someone said, let's hang him, for he's a fool. Oh, but tell me just how was it that he came to rule? They put it up today. They adapt it. Nobody gets injured out of soul. They come up and hand me a silver key. I do it out and put in my pickup out of They didn't dare out too. Never trust an enemy and never cheat a friend. Just doing what you think is right usually works out in the end. And those people back there, if they didn't get a cake of old Truman back there, and they were leaving my mountain in 24 hours and going back, never going to bed, flying clear across the United States and flying back the next morning. For a party? Yeah, big party. Hell of a big party. <laughs> oh, that was a hell of a party. They're talking about it yet. I've been down just got a dead dozen letters from my friends. When you knew the end was near, you can pass it on. Wild, wild, but it's true the bug stops here. Because this year's heaven I'm going to get, and you are too, you guys, so don't <laughs> take any fun of it. Time now to quickly recap the incredible events on Mount St. Helens today. As you know, the steaming volcano exploded with violent force at 8.39 this morning. Plumes of smoke and ash were tonight were billowing 63,000 feet. That was earlier today, of course. At least eight people are known dead, possibly ten. Several are missing, including 84-year-old Harry Truman of Spirit Lake Lodge. More than 2,000 others have been evacuated. Hardest hit is the Toodle River area. Flash flood warnings are still in effect. Four walls of rampaging water, mud, ice and debris destroyed everything in their path. They wiped out homes, bridges, and felled trees. Ash fall is blowing as far east as Missoula, Montana. Montana, rather. These pictures of Yakima, Washington were taken at noon today. The ash there is now piled up more than four inches thick. Three loggers, severely burned by hot gas and ash, are in stable condition at Emanuel Hospital. They ran eight miles before finding help. 
Just about every highway near the mountain and in the path of the flooding rivers is closed tonight. Telephone lines all over the northwest are jammed. Utility crews are monitoring the levels of dams and reservoirs near the mountain and have already let out some water to relieve pressure due to debris and volcanic material rushing downstream. Once again, at least eight people are dead, several people are known to be missing, and more than 2,000 people in the Tootle River Valley have been evacuated. The situation tonight is extremely dangerous, and the mountain shows no signs of sleeping this evening. Robin? Stan David Jackson is standing by live at our Amboy site where we microwave live pictures. David, what's going on? Well, nothing much going on right now. A few hardcore volcano watchers standing around that are in for the duration, I think, throughout the evening. We got here at about 10 o'clock this morning, and a lot of the pictures that you saw were taken from the Amboy site right here, uh, just behind me, looking back toward the mountain. I think that I should mention that uh, the last view that we did have of it was maybe 9 o'clock, right around there as the sun was setting, and the eruption had subsided considerably, although we could see quite a bit of ash coming up from the area that apparently used to be right around Spirit Lake. We'll be here all night. The cut-ins in the morning begin about 7.25. Crew will be on the scene. Everybody curious to see what the mountain will be doing beginning tomorrow morning. David, thank you. I would assume that that is a pretty eerie feeling being up there right now, isn't it? It is an eerie feeling. In fact, the first thing everybody looks for, of course, is any kind of glow from either forest fires uh, reflecting off any kind of uh, ash or clouds in the sky or anything of that nature. It's just completely dark behind me, so we don't know. All, the, all that we do know is, of course, that there's no lava or anything like that. There's no glow, nothing to see, so apparently the reports that there was lava were incorrect, and some of the people who had said all along that it was just mud, mud flow and uh, ash were entirely right. That's probably what came out. Thank you very much, David. Get some sleep, huh? We'll try. Of course, that's the latest to this hour. If uh, there are new developments this evening, we will keep you posted. And, of course, all morning long tomorrow, we'll have the latest on the volcano from Mount St. Helens. For Robin Anderson and Bill Boaz, Fred Jenkins, I'm Stan Wilson saying thanks for joining us. ABC News is coming up next year on Channel 2. Have a good evening.